First Congo War, published November the 7th, 2017. Special characters are denoted as follows. And denotes left and right parentheses. Denotes an M dash. The First Congo War. 1996 to 1997 was a foreign invasion of Zaire led by Rwanda that replaced President Mobutu Sissiko with the rebel leader Laurent D. Zaire Kabila. Destabilization in eastern Zaire resulting from the Rwandan genocide was the final fact that caused numerous internal and external factors to align against the corrupt and inept government in the capital, Kinshasa. The new government renamed the country to the Democratic Republic of the Congo, but it brought little true change. Kabila alienated his Rwandan and Ugandan allies. To avert a coup, Kabila expelled all Rwandan and Ugandan forces from the Congo. This event was a major cause of the Second Congo War the following year. Some experts prefer to view the two conflicts as one war. Part 1 – Background Part 1 – Background Chapter 1 – Dying State in Zaire An ethnic Kbundi, Mobutu came to power in 1965 and enjoyed support from the United States government because of his anti-communist stance while in office. However, Mobutu's authoritarian rule and policies allowed the Zairean state to decay evidenced by a 65% decrease in Zairean GDP between independence in 1960 and the end of Mobutu's rule in 1997. Following the end of the Cold War circa 1991, the United States stopped supporting Mobutu in favor of what it called a new generation of African leaders, including Rwanda's Kagame and Uganda's Museveni. A wave of democratization swept across Africa during the 1990s. Citation needed. Under substantial internal and external pressure for a democratic transition in Zaire, Mobutu promised reform. He officially ended the one-party system he had maintained since 1967, but ultimately proved unwilling to implement broad reform, alienating allies both at home and abroad. In fact, the Zairean state had all but ceased to exist. The majority of the Zairean population relied on an informal economy for their subsistence, since the official economy was not reliable. Furthermore, the Zairean National Army, Forces Armies Zeruz, FZ, was forced to prey upon the population for survival. Mobiu II himself allegedly once asked FZ soldiers why they needed to pay when they had weapons. Mobutu's rule had encountered considerable internal resistance, and, given the weak central state, rebel groups could find refuge in Zaire's eastern provinces, far from the capital, Kinshasa. Opposition included leftists who had supported Patrice Lumumba. 1925-1961 As well as ethnic and regional minorities opposed to the dominance of Kinshasa. Laurent D. Zaire Kabila an ethnic Kluber from Katanga province who would eventually overthrow Mobutu, had fought Mobutu's regime since its inception. The inability of the Mobutuist regime to control rebel movements in its eastern provinces eventually allowed its internal and external foes to ally. Part 1 – Background Chapter 2 – Ethnic Tensions Tensions had existed between various ethnic groups in eastern Zaire for centuries, especially between the agrarian tribes native to Zaire and semi-nomadic Tutsi tribes that had emigrated from Rwanda at various times. In addition to some Tutsi who were native to eastern Congo, the earliest of these migrants arrived before colonization in the 1880s, followed by emigrants whom the Belgian colonizers forcibly relocated to Congo to perform manual labor. After 1908, and by another significant wave of emigrants fleeing the social revolution of 1959 that brought the Hutu to power in Kigali. All Tutsi emigrants to Zaire before Congolese independence in 1960 are known as Banya Mulench, meaning from Mulench, and had the right to citizenship under Zairean law. 
to see who emigrated to Zaire following independence and known as Bani Oanda, although the native locals often fail to distinguish between the two, naming them both Bani and Malengend considering them foreigners. After coming to power in 1965, Mobutu gave the Bani and Malenj political power in the east in hopes that they, as a minority, would keep a tight grip on power and prevent the more populous ethnicities from forming an opposition. This move aggravated the existing ethnic tensions by strengthening the Bani and Malenj's hold over important stretches of land in North Kivu that indigenous people also claimed as their own. From 1963 to 1966 the Hundenden and ethnic groups of North Kivu fought against Rwandan emigrants. Both Tutsi and Hutu in the Kani Rwandan War, which involved several massacres. Despite a strong Rwandan presence in Mobutu's government, in 1981, Zaire adopted a restrictive citizenship law which denied the Bani and Malenj and Bani Rwanda citizenship and therewithal political rights. Though never enforced, the law greatly angered individuals of Rwandan descent and contributed to a rising sense of ethnic hatred. From 1993 to 1996 Hund, Nand, and Nyanga youth regularly attacked the Bani and Malenj, leading to a total of 14,000 deaths. In 1995 the Zairean parliament ordered all peoples of Rwandan or Burundian descent to be repatriated to their countries of origin, including the Bani and Malenj. Due to political exclusion and ethnic violence, the Bani and Malenj developed ties to the Rwandan Patriotic Front. RPF A mainly Tutsi rebel movement based in Uganda and with power aspirations in Rwanda, as early as 1991. Part 1 – Background Chapter 3 – Rwandan Genocide the deciding event in precipitating the war was the genocide in neighboring Rwanda in 1994, which sparked a mass exodus of refugees known as the Great Lakes Refugee Crisis. During the 100-day genocide, hundreds of thousands of Tutsis and sympathizers were massacred at the hands of predominantly Hutu aggressors. The genocide ended when the Hutu government in Kigali was overthrown by the Tutsi-dominated Rwandan Patriotic Front. RPF Of those who fled Rwanda during the crisis, about 1.5 million settled in eastern Zaire. These refugees included Tutsi who fled the Hutu genocidaires, as well as 1 million Hutus that fled the Tutsi RPF's subsequent retaliation. Prominent among the latter group were the genocidaires themselves, such as elements of the former Rwandan army, forces armies Rwandais, Ever. and independent Hutu extremist groups known as Interahamu. Often, these Hutu forces allied themselves with local Mai Mai militias, who granted them access to mines and weapons. Though these were initially self-defense organizations, they quickly became the aggressors. The Hutu set up camps in eastern Zaire from which they attacked both the newly arrived Rwandan Tutsi as well as the Bani and Malenj and Bani Rwanda. These attacks were the cause of about 100 deaths a month during the first half of 1996. Furthermore, the newly arrived militants were intent on returning to power in Rwanda and began launching attacks against the new regime in Kigali, which represented a serious security threat to the infant state. Not only was the Mobutu government incapable of controlling the former genocidaires, for previously mentioned reasons but actually supported them in training and supplying for an invasion of Rwanda, forcing Kigali to act. Part 2 – Bani and Malenj Rebellion Given the exacerbated ethnic tensions and the lack of government control in the East, Rwanda was to take action against the security threat posed by the genocidaires who had found refuge in eastern Zaire. The government in Kigali had begun forming Tutsi militias for operations in Zaire as early as 1995 and chose to act following an exchange of fire between Rwandan Tutsi and Zairean Green Barrets that marked the outbreak of the Bani and Malenj rebellion on 31 August 1996. While there was general unrest in eastern Zaire, the rebellion was unlikely a grassroots movement, Uganda President Yao Eri Museveni, 
who supported and worked closely with Rwanda in the First Congo War, later recalled that the rebellion was incited by Zairean Tutsi who had been recruited by the Rwandan Patriotic Army. RPA the initial goal of the Banya Malenge rebellion was to seize power in Zaire's East and Kivu provinces and combat the extremist Hutu forces that were attempting to continue the genocide in their new home. However, the rebellion did not remain Tutsi dominated for long. Mobutu's harsh and selfish rule had created enemies in virtually all sectors of Zairean society. As a result, the new rebellion benefited from massive public support and grew to be a general revolution rather than a mere Banya Milenge uprising. Banya Milenge elements as well as non-Tutsi militias coalesced into the Alliance of Democratic Forces for the Liberation of Congo. A FDL Under the leadership of Laurent Dsi Kabila, who had been a long-time opponent of the Mobutu government and was a leader of one of the three main rebel groups that founded the AFDL. While the AFDL was an ostensibly Zairean rebel movement, Rwanda had played a key role in its formation. Observers of the war, as well as the Rwandan defense minister and vice president at the time, Paul Kagame, claim that the FDL was formed in and directed from Kigali and contained not only Rwandan trained troops but also regulars of the RPA. Part 3 – Foreign Involvement Part 3 – Foreign Involvement Chapter 1 – Rwanda According to expert observers, as well as Kagame himself, Rwanda played the largest role of a foreign actor, if not the largest role of all, in the First Congo War. Kigali was instrumental in the formation of the FDL and sent its own troops to fight alongside the rebels. While its actions were originally sparked by the security threat posed by the Zairean-based genocidaires, Kigali was pursuing multiple goals during its invasion of Zaire. The first and foremost of these was the suppression of the genocidaires who had been launching attacks against the new Rwandan state from Zaire. Kagame claimed that Rwandan agents had discovered the plans to invade Rwanda with support from Mobutu. In response, Kigali began its intervention with the intention of dismantling the refugee camps in which the genocidaires often took refuge and destroying the structure of these anti-Rwandan elements. A second goal that is cited by Kagame and which is universally regarded as accurate, is the overthrow of Mobutu. While this was partially a means to minimizing the threat in eastern Zaire, it was also a chance for the new Rwandan state to set up a puppet regime in Kinshasa. This goal was not particularly threatening to other states in the region because it was ostensibly a means to securing Rwandan security and because many of them were also opposed to Mobutu. Internationally, Kigali was also aided by the tacit support of the United States, which supported Kagame as a member of the new generation of African leaders. However, the true intentions of Rwanda are not entirely clear. Some authors have proposed that the dismantling of refugee camps was a means of replenishing Rwanda's depleted population and workforce following the genocide, because the destruction of camps was followed by the forced repatriation of Tutsi regardless of whether they were Rwandan or Zairean. The intervention may also have been motivated by revenge. The Rwandan forces, as well as the FDL, massacred retreating Hutu refugees in several known instances. A commonly cited factor for Rwandan actions is that the RPF, which had recently come to power in Kigali, had come to see itself as the protector of the Tutsi nation and was therefore partially acting in defense of its Zairean brethren. There is also a distinct possibility that Rwanda harbored ambitions to annex portions of eastern Zaire. Pustabiz Amungu himself, president of Rwanda from 1994 to 2000, presented the then U.S. ambassador to Rwanda, Robert Grubin, with the idea of a greater Rwanda. This idea purports that the ancient state of Rwanda included parts of eastern Zaire that should actually belong to Rwanda. However, it appears that Rwanda never seriously attempted to annex these territories. The history of conflict in the Congo is often associated with illegal resource exploitation but, although Rwanda did benefit financially by plundering Zaire's wealth, 
This is not usually considered an initial motivation for Rwandan intervention in the First Congo War. Part 3 Foreign Involvement Chapter 2 Uganda As a close ally of the RPF, Uganda also played a major role in the First Congo War. Prominent members of the RPF had fought alongside Museveni in the Ugandan Bush War that had brought him to power, and Museveni had allowed the RPF to use Uganda as a base during the 1990 offensive into Rwanda and subsequent civil war. Given their historical ties, the Rwandan and Ugandan governments were closely allied and thus Museveni worked closely with Kagame throughout the First Congo War. Ugandan soldiers were present in Zaire throughout the conflict and Museveni likely helped Kagam plan and direct the FDL. Lieutenant Colonel James Carber above the FDL, for example, was a former member of Uganda's National Resistance Army, the military wing of the rebel movement that brought Museveni to power and French and Belgian intelligence reported that 15,000 Ugandan trained Tutsi fought for the FDL. However, Uganda did not support Rwanda in all aspects of the war. Museveni was reportedly much less inclined to overthrow Mobutu, preferring to keep the rebellion in the east where the former genocidaires were operating. Part 3 – Foreign Involvement Chapter 3 – Angola. Angola remained on the sidelines until 1997 but its entrance into the fray greatly increased the already superior strength of anti-Mobutu forces. The Angolan government chose to act primarily through cartains gendarmes called the Tigris, which were proxy groups formed from the descendants of police units who had been exiled from Zaire and thus were fighting for a return to their homeland. Luanda did also deploy regular troops. Angola chose to participate in the First Congo War because members of Mobutu's government were directly involved in supplying the Angolan rebel group UNITA. It is unclear exactly how the government benefited from this relationship, other than personal enrichment for several officials, but it is certainly possible that Mobutu was unable to control the actions of some members of his government. Regardless of the reasoning in Kinshasa, Angola entered the war on the side of the rebels and was determined to overthrow the Mobutu government, as this would be the only way to address the threat posed by the Zairean UNITA relationship. Part 3 Foreign Involvement Chapter 4 UNITA Due to its ties to the Mobutu government, UNITA also participated in the First Congo War. The greatest impact that it had on the war was probably that it gave Angola reason to join the anti-Mobutu coalition. However, UNITA forces fought alongside FZ forces in at least several instances. Among other examples, Kagam claimed that his forces fought a pitched battle against UNITA near Kinshasa towards the end of the war. Part 3 – Foreign Involvement Chapter 5 – Others Numerous other external actors played lesser roles in the First Congo War. Burundi, which had recently come under the rule of a pro-Tutsi leader, was supportive of Rwandan and Ugandan involvement in Zaire but provided very limited military support. Zambia and Zimbabwe also gave measured amounts of military support to the rebel movement. Likewise, Eritrea, Ethiopia, and the South Sudanese rebel army of the SPLA were all financial or moral supporters of the anti-Mobutu coalition. Other than from UNITA, Mobutu also received some aid from Sudan, whom Mobutu had long supported against the SPLA, though the exact amount of aid is unclear and ultimately was unable to hinder the advance of opposing forces. Zaire also employed foreign mercenaries from several African and European countries. Part 4, 1996 With active support from Rwanda and Uganda, Kabilaza FDL was able to capture 800 x 100 km of territory along the border with Rwanda, Uganda, and Burundi by the 25th of December 1996. This occupation temporarily satisfied the rebels, 
because it gave them power in the east and allowed them to defend themselves against the former Genocidaires. Likewise, the external actors had successfully crippled the ability of the same Genocidaires to use Zaire as a base for attacks. There was a pause in the rebel advance following the acquisition of this buffer territory that lasted until Angola entered the war in February 1997. During this time, Rwanda was able to destroy refugee camps, which the Genocidaires had been using as their safe bases, and forcibly repatriate Tutsi to Rwanda. It also captured many lucrative diamond and coal tin mines, which it was late reluctant to relinquish. During this process, Rwandan and aligned forces committed multiple atrocities, mainly against Hutu refugees. The true extent of the abuses is unknown because the FDL and RPF carefully managed NGO and press access to areas where atrocities were thought to have occurred however Amnesty International claimed as many as 200,000 Rwandese Hutu refugees were massacred by them and the Rwandan Defense Forces and Aligned Forces. The United Nations similarly documented mass killings of civilians by Rwandan, Ugandan and the FDL soldiers in the DRC mapping exercise report. Part 5, 1997 There are two explanations for the restart of the rebel advance in 1997. The first and most probable is that Angola had joined the anti-Mobuta coalition, giving that numbers and strength far superior to the FOZ and demanding that Mobutu be removed from power. Kagam presents another, possibly secondary, reason for the march on Kinshasa, that the employment of Serbian mercenaries in the battle for Wallagale proved that Mobutu intended to wage real war against Rwanda. According to this logic, Rwanda's initial concerns had been to manage the security threat in eastern Zaire but it was now forced to dispose of the hostile government in Kinshasa. Whatever the case, once the advance resumed in 1997, there was virtually no meaningful resistance from what was left of Mobutu's army. Kabila's forces were only held back by the dreadful state of Zaire's infrastructure. In some areas, no real roads existed. The only means of transport were infrequently used dirt paths. The FDL committed grave human rights violations, such as the carnage at a refugee camp of Hutus at Tinji Tinji near Kisangani where tens of thousands of refugees were massacred. Coming from the east, the FDL advanced westward in two pincer movements, the northern one took Kisangani, Bund, and Mbandaka, while the southern one took Bukwanga and Kikwit. They reached Kinshasa by the middle of May. Another FDL group captured Lubumbashi on April 19 and moved on by air to Kinshasa. Mobutu fled Kinshasa on May 16, and the Liberatures entered the capital without serious resistance. Throughout the rebel advance, there were attempts by the international community to negotiate a settlement. However, the FDL did not take these negotiations seriously but instead partook so as to avoid international criticism for being unwilling to attempt a diplomatic solution while actually continuing its steady advance. The FZ, which had been weak all along, was unable to mount any serious resistance to the stronger FDL and its foreign sponsors. Mobutu fled first to his palace at Kbadalite and then to Rabat, Morocco, where he died on the 7th of September 1997. Kabila proclaimed himself president on the 17th of May, and immediately ordered a violent crackdown to restore order. He then attempted to reorganize the nation as the Democratic Republic of the Congo. DRC Part 6 – Aftermath the new Congolese state under Kabila's rule proved to be disappointingly similar to Zaire and Mobutu. The economy remained in a state of severe disrepair and had even deteriorated further under Kabila's corrupt rule. Furthermore, he failed to improve the government, which continued to be weak and corrupt. Instead, Kabila began a vigorous centralization campaign, bringing renewed conflict with minority groups in the East who demanded autonomy. Kabila also came to be seen as an instrument of the foreign regimes that put him in power. To counter this image and increase domestic support, he began to turn against his allies abroad. 
This culminated in the expulsion of all foreign forces from the DRC on the 26th of July 1998. The states with armed forces still in the DRC begrudgingly complied although some of them saw this as undermining their interests, particularly Rwanda, which had hoped to install a proxy regime in Kinshasa. Several factors that led to the First Congo War remained in place after Kabila's accession to power. Prominent among these were ethnic tensions in eastern DRC, where the government still had little control. There the historical animosities remained and the opinion that Bania Malenche, as well as all Tutsi, where foreigners was reinforced by the foreign occupation in their defense. Furthermore, Rwanda had not been able to satisfactorily address its security concerns. By forcibly repatriating refugees, Rwanda had imported the conflict. This manifested itself in the form of a predominantly Hutu insurgency in Rwanda's western provinces that was supported by extremist elements in eastern DRC. Without troops in the DRC, Rwanda was unable to successfully combat the insurgents. In the first days of August 1998, two brigades of the new Congolese army rebelled against the government and formed rebel groups that worked closely with Kigali and Kampala. This marked the beginning of the Second Congo War. This recording is a derivative work from Wikipedia. For more information, please visit www.frogcast.org.